Hello, friends. As we continue in the Sermon on the Mount today, uh, we're going to be getting into a section of Matthew 5 that we're probably going to spend at least a few weeks uh, exploring. That's because this is such a central passage, not only to the whole Sermon on the Mount, but actually to the life and teaching of Jesus, and also to our own process of spiritual growth and transformation as followers of Jesus Christ. So if we can get to a deeper understanding of this, we're going to come to a deeper understanding of everything. Uh, So this is going to be important, and we're going to walk through it slowly, but I'm excited to get into this. I think if you can really dig into this, you will be able on your own to go through the Sermon on the Mount or any scripture and to see it uh, in a richer way through Jesus Christ. So, listen and hear the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today we're just going to begin maybe with that first sentence or two. When Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Uh, We could spend a whole day just talking about that. When Jesus is talking about the law or the prophets, let's make sure that we know what he's talking about. Because for any Jew in the first century, they would immediately know that the scriptures uh, are made up of three basic parts, which is the law of Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the prophets, and also uh, the Psalms. And so Jesus, when he talks about the law and the prophets, he's talking about uh, the majority of the scripture of his people. This was essentially Jesus' Bible, even if that's not the word that he would have used for it. These are the scriptures that he was raised on. And one of the only stories we have about Jesus in his childhood is that he was in the temple at 12 years old debating with the religious leaders about the scripture, about the law and the prophets. And they were amazed at his wisdom. So Jesus loved the law and the prophets. But let's also not forget that Jesus, uh, the Christ, was there in the beginning, before, long, long before, anything was ever written down in the law or the prophets, that they belong to him. The words belong to him. He is ultimately, even though that there were men who wrote them down, ultimately he is the author of the law and the prophets. He maintains the copyright, as it were, and he can do with it whatever he wants. And in a very subtle way, he reminds us of that when he says, I came not to abolish, but to fulfill. That very simple statement, I came, in a subtle, quiet way, points us to a startling, huge reality, which is that Jesus has come from the Father to earth to do this work to not abolish, but to fulfill. And even in just saying, I came, he is pointing to his own role as the Messiah, the anointed one who's been anointed to do this work, and also as the Christ, because he is also God. 
So that's a huge statement and concept just in and of itself. But he says, what I've come to do is not to abolish. I'm not going to just chuck the whole thing, but I'm going to fulfill it. And as human beings, we're tempted to do one or the other, right? We either want to cling white-knuckled to uh, religion or to faith as we understand it, as it was given to me by my parents or my grandparents. We want to cling to that so tightly and make sure that we don't mess up on even one little thing. Uh, And that's the culture of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And then we're tempted to either do that or to go to the other extreme. We either cling to the law or we want to, uh, in Jesus' words, abolish it. We just want to chuck the whole thing, right? And I see this a lot, especially in younger generations where we see uh, that the older generation clinging to the law and we say, I don't want that. And then we're tempted to go to the other extreme, to either say, I can just do whatever I want. There's freedom in Christ. Whatever doesn't really matter. Or even worse, we might just chuck the whole Jesus thing altogether. And Jesus introduces a third way. He said, I'm not here to cling to the law. I'm not here to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. And the word in Hebrew uh, for fulfill is kum. And it means to set up, to raise up, or to set in its place. And most fascinating of all is that that's the same word in Hebrew that is used for resurrection. So in a sense, what Jesus is saying is, I have come not to get rid of the law, but to resurrect it, to uh, breathe new life into it. And what's really interesting to think about is that what Jesus' own life does, that his process of uh, of growth, his life, his teaching, and then his death and resurrection is the same trajectory that he intends for the law and the prophets. That uh, what looks like death, what looks like abolishing, is in fact a path to new life. And when Jesus died on the cross, it looked like defeat, but it was in fact victory. And it looked like death. In fact, it was death. There was no illusion about it. He actually died. He actually suffered, but it wasn't the end. It turned into a new kind of life, one that we couldn't even have imagined before, one that was greater and richer than what we could have ever had before. And that's what Jesus is doing with the law. It looks like he's breaking the law. Uh, And that's what he gets accused of all the time by the religious leaders. If you look in Matthew 15, for example, you'll see the religious leaders are mad at Jesus because he doesn't follow the ritual washing ceremony before he eats. And they call him out on it. And then he in turn calls them out on their own hypocrisy about the law. Because even for those of us who are most religious, who are most uh, morally righteous, who are trying to do everything right, in our own minds, we're pretty good. But God sees right through it. He sees the ways that we fall short. He sees our own hypocrisy. And he's come not to accuse us, not to condemn us, but to, in fact, to tear down that old system of self-justification and to give us something new, to take what the law was always intended to do and to fulfill it, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. But it's painful for Jesus because he dies on a cross before He's resurrected to new life. And for those of us that follow him, the invitation is to take up our own cross and to follow him daily so that we, in fact, will have to go through a process like Jesus' own death and resurrection. And it's painful. And uh, I, I can tell you, friends, that in my own life, when I the periods where I have undergone the greatest spiritual growth have always, always 
been preceded by the darkest, most painful moments of my spiritual life. That before I can experience new life, I have to go through some kind of death. And every time I grow in my faith, it doesn't feel like growing at first. It feels like I'm losing my faith. And there's no guarantee while I'm growing through it that I'll come out better on the other side. It just feels like death. It just feels like defeat. But the promise of resurrection life is that on the other side of death is life to the full. When my daughter, uh, my firstborn, Corey, was about 18 months old, I remember that she had already outgrown her 18-month clothing. And she had all of these adorable little girl clothes, right? These jumpsuits and onesies and skirts and dresses. And I just loved every single outfit. And I remember the day that we accepted the fact that she had outgrown every one of these pieces of clothing. We went into her room, opened the dresser drawers, and we're putting each article of clothing in a box. And I remember there was one particular outfit that I loved, and I picked it up, and I was going to put it in the box. And I just stopped, and I started weeping, and I just got all mushy on the inside and on the outside because I realized She will never wear this again. She has outgrown this outfit. And and it's really not that I loved that polka dot jumpsuit so much, but that it represented such a special season of her life that we will never repeat. It's already gone. And it was such a, a, a heaviness of heart and such a sadness when I placed that, uh, that article of clothing in a box, knowing that it would be put away and she would never wear it again. And it was genuinely sad and painful to let go of that. And of course, that doesn't happen once. It happens every season, practically, when you have kids. But without fail, no sooner do we uh, cry and blubber and put away the old clothes than we go into the storage room And we get out a box of clothes that will now fit her better. And it's the same with the spiritual life. How many Christians do you know that are still clinging to the faith that they had when they were a child? And that's not to say that you abandon your faith, but it has to grow. And if it doesn't, it's just as ridiculous as an adult walking around in in kids' clothes that don't fit anymore. Because true transformation and growth is always about letting go and trusting that God will give us what we need. And just like growing up, it's a process of going from an external law to an internal law. This isn't just a religious concept. This is what we each go through with our entire life. That it's the process of going from childhood to adulthood. When my kids are young, I have to tell them, this is when you can cross the road. These are the rules. This is the things you can play with and the things that you can't play with because you would get hurt. And we have to explicitly say, you do this. You don't do that. And we have to spell out every single thing because they don't have an internal process to make those own judgments for themselves. But... Part of growing up is coming to a place where I no longer, as the parent, need to tell my kid what to do because they've learned the rules and they know how to follow them well and they also know how to break them well. They know how to live not with an externalized law, but an internalized law. And don't just take my word for it, but this is how Paul talks about the spiritual life as well. He'll sometimes use the terms of the flesh and the spirit. Uh, But I think for our own purposes, it's easy to talk about an external law versus an internal law. And that's, in fact, what he's saying here. I want to read to you from Philippians chapter 3. Starting in verse 2, he says, "Uh, Beware of those religious hypocrites who teach that you should be circumcised to please God. For we have already experienced heart circumcision. 
And we worship God in the power and freedom of the Holy Spirit, not in laws and religious duties. We are those who boast in what Jesus Christ has done and not in what we can accomplish in our own strength. So he's talking about going from a system that for for generations had been about external, and he uses a very specific external image of circumcision, something very tangible and real and external. And he says, it's not about that anymore. It's not about circumcision of the body, but of the heart. It's not about the external law, but the internal law. That's where freedom in Christ, that's what freedom in Christ is. And he says uh, that he talks about his own process of going from being a hyper-religious person, a Pharisee among Pharisees, and letting all of it go. If you read in Philippians 3, starting in verse 7, yet all of the accomplishments that I once took credit for, I've now forsaken them, and I regard them as nothing compared to the delight of experiencing Jesus Christ as my Lord. To truly know him meant letting go of everything from my past and throwing all my boasting on the garbage heap. It's all like a pile of manure to me now so that I may be enriched in the reality of knowing Jesus Christ and embrace him as Lord in all of his greatness. The spiritual life for not just for Jesus, but for every one of us, is about going from living in externalized religion, something that's outside of me, to internalized life in the spirit. Living under the law versus living in the presence of God, that God is dwelling in me all of the time. And Paul says, forget my old self-righteousness, forget the moral codes, forget being a great Christian. That's all a, a pile of manure to me now compared to just knowing Jesus Christ. As Protestants, many of us miss this imagery, but I love the story of Mary. And we sometimes discount her as a model for us in the Christian life. But Mary was a a good Jewish girl living in the first century, and uh, she was living under the law. She was living under the law and the prophets. She was a good Jewish girl, and she was a young girl. She was a young teenage girl. And an angel of the Lord comes to her and says, you're going to have a baby, (laughs) And this is God's doing. He is going to conceive a child in you. And Mary's response is utterly astonishing. And she says, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Friends, on the spiritual life, there's nothing you can really do to achieve it, to accomplish it. You can't shortcut it. You can't say, okay, cool, I want to be spiritually mature and just decide to do it. You have to walk it. And it's going to be painful. It's going to mean letting go. It's going to mean loss and a death of things that you once held dear. It's going to mean a death of your old self. And it's going to just feel like defeat. But the promise is that on the other side of death is life and life to the full. And really our only things that we can do is that we can either resist it and cling to what we had before or we can accept it. We can let go. The spiritual journey is not really something that you can do as much as it's something that God can do to you. And you simply allow it to happen and you say, okay, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. So friends, let that be your prayer. As God is testing you and trying you and you are being stretched in ways that are super uncomfortable for you and it feels like you're just losing your faith, don't abandon it, but hand it to God and say, I trust you with this. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And I promise you, it won't be easy and it won't be quick, but God is faithful. 
and he will birth in you a new life in the spirit, that he will implant something inside of you that will grow. And Jesus Christ himself will be born in you and through you into the world around you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.